Let's welcome our host for today's event, Dr. Phil Plate, also known as the Bad Astronomer. Take it away for me. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. I am really happy to be here hosting and moderating this event with some great projects and some great people. And I'm thrilled to have been invited by SciStarter uh, because I am an astronomer and science communicator. I have a degree in astronomy, went to grad school, did all that, did a bunch of research and eventually decided that I enjoyed talking about astronomy even more than than doing it professionally. And I still have a telescope. I still go out and observe the uh, the sun as well as the stars at night. Uh, but uh, I really, really enjoy talking to people about astronomy, writing about it. I write for Scientific American, for example, the magazine. And I have a newsletter which comes out three times a week where I talk about uh, astronomy and science. People love this stuff and they should because astronomy is really cool and it has a profound effect on our lives and on our planet. And really nothing has a bigger effect on us than the sun. Uh, and eclipses are super cool in a super cool way to learn about the sun. So I'm really happy to be talking about this and, and you in the audience can participate in this. This isn't just simply where we're going to be talking about science, we're going to be talking about science that you can do. These are called citizen science projects and citizen just means people, not necessarily trained astronomers. You don't have to be a citizen of any country or anything like that. You just have to be a citizen of planet Earth and to be able to participate in these things. You have to be able to just experience what's going on around you. And that comes at different levels. We're going to have some projects where you just have to pay attention to what's happening and other ones where you need some equipment, you need to have a little bit of training. We'll talk about all that uh, as the as the folks here will be discussing their projects. Uh, but I love citizen science projects because it gets people involved in real science and it gets you immersed in what is going on in the scientist world and also just because it's cool to do science. It's a lot of fun and you wind up learning more about the world around you, about the universe around you by participating in it. So let's talk a little bit about what we're going to be doing here today. And we go to the next slide. There we go. Uh, so welcome to do NASA Science Live. That's what we're doing here tonight. We're going to be talking about eclipses, specifically solar eclipses, and even more specifically, the total solar eclipse next year and the annular eclipse coming up in just less than a month. And we'll talk about what all that means, what these things are, when they're going to happen, where and why they are important to us. We're also going to talk about the heliophysics big year. We have a special guest going to be talking about that and what you need to do to prepare for and participate in these eclipse research projects. We're also going to be doing five of these NASA projects and then during those talks, when uh, the person presenting their project is done, we'll have a little bit of q and I'll be asking them questions. You can ask questions from the audience. And then at the end of the whole thing, when everybody's done, we're going to have a wide open Q&A where you can have questions for anybody that uh, to whom you want to get an answer from. I think there was some grammar in that sentence someplace. I'm not exactly sure. So back in 2017, was a terrific total solar eclipse that swept across the United States of America. It may have been the most watched solar eclipse of all time, not because it was necessarily in America, but because it actually passed over a lot of big cities. And next year's eclipse is going to do the same thing. It's going to pass over a lot of cities with a lot of people in it. And in 2017, I went to uh, Wyoming, which when I lived uh, in Colorado was only a few hours drive and watched the eclipse happen. I brought some friends with me, some folks, and we all watched this solar eclipse. Now I'm going to tell you, as an astronomer of some years old, that was my first total solar eclipse. I'd not seen one my entire life until six years ago. And it was profound. It was so beautiful to be able to see the sun's outer atmosphere. It got dark. We didn't hear any animals or anything like that because I was in the middle of nowhere, Wyoming, and there wasn't a lot of crickets or anything like that. But it was really a life changing and gorgeous event. And I'm wondering, and we're all wondering, did you see it? Where were you? Where were you? Were you in the path of totality or not? What, where were you specifically? What was it like? And, and who were you with? What did you experience? Uh, go ahead and just uh, start up the chat, get in there and let us know. 
And I already see a few coming in in Pittsburgh. Oh, somebody who's an eclipse chaser, seeing them all over the world. That's awesome. I am planning on that eclipse not being my last. Let me tell you that. Uh, I have friends who have seen dozens of eclipses. They're called umbrophiles, shadow chasers. Uh, and that's, that's pretty cool too. Uh, and that's not something I necessarily want to do all the time, uh, but it is something I would like to do again, to be able to go see one of these because they're magnificent. So while you all are doing that, uh, I'm going to tell you about sort of the basics of what an eclipse is. Um, we have an, a lovely animation that shows you how this works. The moon orbits the earth. And it orbits the Earth at an angle. And if it, if it orbited the Earth in the same plane as the Earth orbited the Sun, we'd get a solar eclipse every month, but it doesn't. And so these don't happen all the time. And what happens is when they do happen is the Moon gets in between the Earth and the Sun and passes directly in front of the Sun as we see it on the Earth. If you could see it from space, like in this animation, the Moon would be hanging over the Earth and casting its shadow on the planet. And that shadow is small where it completely blocks the sun. So you have to be in a very specific place at a very specific time to see the moon completely block the sun. If you're not in that totality path, that path of the total solar eclipse, you get a partial eclipse, which means the moon doesn't completely block the sun. That's still really cool. Uh, and you need special, you need special glasses and things like that to watch it. Um, but you do get to see something. And if you're in the path of totality, for example, uh, in this map shows us the two eclipses coming up. Now we have an eclipse, uh, uh, where are my notes? Uh, coming up in October, October 8th, uh, wait a minute, I was gonna say 18th and that's today. Um, October 14th, pardon me, there we go. Yeah, October 14th, somebody's saying in the chat. Uh, and that is going to come sweep across the earth, across the um, Pacific Northwest down into Texas. And uh, that is, we'll talk about this, about how this, how this eclipse will work in a moment. Uh, but then the next eclipse, which is on April 8th, 2024, that's gonna sweep up across Mexico, uh, across Texas and um, Arkansas, and up through the Midwest, and then up into uh, New England. And you have to be, again, on this very narrow path to see it is a total eclipse. And it only lasts for a few minutes. And it's a very, very special, lovely event. Uh, and if you if you get a chance to go, believe me, you want to go. And so uh, all of this is available online. Um, if you want to be able to see the eclipse without any special equipment, besides, for example, a pair of uh, eclipse glasses, which are just special filters that are in uh, paper that you can just put on your face and look at the eclipse when it's not total because you want to protect your eyes from the sun, uh, you can get those from a, a number of, of sources, including SciStarter. They have will have links up uh, where you can order those. And um, I want you to be careful and observe this safely. When the sun is exposed in the sky, you don't want to look at it with your eyes. You want to be wearing these glasses or have the right kind of equipment. There's a lot of bad advice on what you can wear. You want to go to a, a, a trusted source and, and know what kind of filters you can use. During totality, you can take those eclipses off, look at the sun, and it's perfectly safe. But then totality is about to end. you got to get those glasses back up. And, uh, and you'll be fine. Ah, in the chat room now, we have uh, from Roland and SciStarter, we've got uh, a link to eclipse.aas.org, aas.org, slash resources, slash solar dash filters. And there are a bunch of other places you can get them as well. So that's my spiel. Now I'm going to throw this to Mark Kushner, an astrophysicist at my old stomping grounds at Goddard Space Flight Center at NASA, who is going to tell us about the heliophysics big year, and eclipses in general. Hey, Phil. Yeah, we haven't Mark. seen you at the old stomping grounds in a while. We should I haven't been back in a while. The last time I was there was to talk about a lunar eclipse. So there you go. That's awesome. Well, I'm going to tell you now about the heliophysics big year. Eclipses, yes. But crazy thing is there's even more sun science, crazy sun events going on during this span that starts with the October eclipse, right? So... Um, I don't have to tell you how important the sun is to us, right? You know, kind of, it's our origin story. It creates all the energy for life. Even little tiny changes in the sun can make a huge difference for agriculture, for climate, for energy, for communications, right? So um, we have this huge division at, at NASA called heliophysics division. Heliophysics is the 
study of the sun, but it's also the study of the many ways that the sun affects the earth. Like I was just saying, through the solar wind, all those energetic particles crashing into our magnetosphere and creating aurorae and affecting uh, communication satellites and doing all kinds of, of, of fascinating stuff. Um, so the heliophysics year is about a whole variety of different sun science, starting with and continuing beyond those eclipses. So let me show you now on the next slide some of the of the events that are going on. So we've got that annular solar eclipse, October 14th, and we have that solar solar, solar eclipse that I know many of you are going to go travel to see April 8th. Also, get this, December 24th of 2024, the Parker Solar Probe is going to make its closest approach to the sun. Well, I heard of the Parker Solar Probe. Yes, perihelion, someone said. Exactly. So the Parker Solar Probe is just this record-breaking NASA mission, record-breaking in multiple ways. And at that moment, it's going to become the closest man-made object that's ever uh, been to the sun. It's going to be nine uh, solar radii away. I mean, that's, you know, that, why doesn't the thing vaporize? It's, it's pretty incredible. So um, it's going to be super close to the sun. It's going to investigate the corona, the magnetic fields, uh, how the solar wind is generated, and also at that moment, it's going to become the fastest ever human created object. It's going to be flying at that moment when it's at perihelion. It's going to be going 191 kilometers per second. So it's, it's, it's doubly wild. Okay, so we've got the eclipses. We've got the closest approach. And on the next slide, we've also got solar maximum coming up. So it, I guess it's not technically until the following year, but as we get closer to solar maximum, there's all of these interesting magnetic events ramping up on the sun. So the sun has this 11 year cycle during which its magnetic fields get increasingly twisted and, and wound together. And um, the, through this effect called magnetic buoyancy, it lifts all this stuff up from the inside the, of the sun and it creates flares, it creates um, sunspots. And you can see in this comparison of what the sun looks like, uh, this is a, in a filter, probably a magnesium filter used for highlighting magnetic activity, right? So um, you can see that there's a heck of a lot more stuff going on at, at maximum. And we're going to have the opportunity to study this as well during this year. So during the heliophysics big year, we're asking for help. We're asking for you to do as much heliophysics science as you possibly can uh, to help NASA learn more about our closest star. Next slide. A little bit more about those eclipses. Uh, yeah, that animation kind of beats all, doesn't it? That, that Phil just showed. But here's some pictures, some photos, videos are actually really of, of what it looked like in the sky. Uh, so uh, annular solar eclipse, of course, is when the, the moon is close to um, its maximum distance from the Earth. Anybody know what that the term for that is? Extra points, if you know, term. Not, not, not counting bad astronomers, only good astronomers. The term for when the moon is at maximum distance from the earth. It's not peri, it's apo, and it's not aphelion, it's ap, G, John, you, I, and Barbara. Yes, excellent. All right. Um, so when the moon is close to apogee, uh, instead of blocking out the whole uh, solar disk, it just, um, creates this really cool looking ring. Um, but then in April, we're gonna have a total solar eclipse uh, where you'll have just darkness. Um, and as it sounds like many of you have seen this already and you know how it just it just stops your heart at that moment. So um, that's the story with eclipses. And uh, next slide, I just wanted to highlight that uh, the heliophysics big year science just has all these ramifications. It's, it stretches out into, into different scientific fields. Like on the right, you can see an image of a solar eclipse uh, viewed from Mars. So this is Mars's moon Phobos passing in front of the sun. <laughs> Pretty neat. You can see that the moon isn't really round, right? Um, and then on the left, is a, there's an animation depicting a eclipse of an exoplanet. So when an exoplanet eclipses, it's called a transit. Uh, and the crazy thing is that by studying solar eclipses, we're also learning information that helps us find out more about planets around other suns, around other stars. Uh, so we'll be highlighting a variety of different participatory science projects that are related to the uh, solar eclipse 
and the heliophysics big year during this upcoming year as well. My last slide, um, you know, come join. We have more than 2 million volunteers who have been participating in NASA research through our various collaborative projects. And, and I hope you'll come pick one, anyone that sounds cool. And I, that's a hard choice. <laughs> uh, they all sound cool to me. Um, and for a total complete list of all of our various different participatory science projects that need help, uh, just go to science.nasa.gov slash citizen science. And now back to you, Phil. Well, that was super cool. And uh, I got to say, I love the uh, the eclipses seen on Mars. Those are so neat. Those, those potato shaped moons passing in front of the sun. And also uh, in the 2017 eclipse, uh, the sun was not terribly active. Uh, so the, the, the corona, the sun's outer atmosphere was beautiful. Don't get me wrong, but there wasn't a lot of structure to it. Not as much as we might expect to see in this one next year when the sun's going to be magnetically quite active. So I'm quite excited to see what we're going to see. No kidding. And also, I've never seen an annular eclipse, and I'm unfortunately not in the path, and I have a feeling I'll be watching that one from home. But either way, if you if you are watching this eclipse, people are talking about this in the chat, make sure you are wearing the correct eye protection. Never look at the sun without eye protection, except during the moments of totality, then it's okay. Uh, if, you, if you have any questions about that, uh, anybody will be uh, more than happy to answer them. I'll put my email in the chat. You stay in touch. Oh, great. That's a great idea. And I'm easy to find online. Um, our first speaker now, we're gonna go to the, to the, uh, to the panelists. Uh, I shouldn't say our first speaker, Mark was our first speaker, but our five panelists are gonna be talking about the projects that they're going to be doing uh, that you can participate in. And I, I gotta say again, super cool that anybody can participate in these. Uh, we're gonna go to Gordon Emsley from SunSketcher. In a sec, we're working on getting him on. Uh, I'm watching, it's fun actually watching all of the uh, questions go by. People are asking about, you know, can I see it where I am? Uh, if you go online and, and just type in something like total solar eclipse path 2024, uh, there are a lot of interactive charts you can find online where you can, um, you can see where it's going to be. Some places even tell you how long it's going to be, and you can even zoom in on the map and really pinpoint where it's going to be. They're actually quite accurate, which is pretty cool. Um, oh, somebody asked a good question. Uh, during the total eclipse, if someone's watching from their backyard uh, with no scientists around, how can you be sure when it's total and safe to view without uh, glasses? That's from Kathy. That's a good question. Um, keep the glasses on. And when the sun, you'll be able to see the sun through the glasses. It'll just be a bright patch, typically orange in color. The glasses make it look kind of orange. The sun will disappear and you will see nothing through those glasses. They're quite dark. Um, and uh, it, if you're in the path of totality, it's going to get dark. You're going to look around and say, oh, it's like it's like nighttime almost, twilight. Then it's safe to take them off. And if you know how long the eclipse is going to go, um, I actually had my phone out in the 2017 eclipse and uh, had, a time, had a timer on it. It was two minutes and seven seconds, I think, where it was. So I set my alarm for two minutes, and then I knew I had a few seconds to tell everybody, it's about to end, put your glasses back on, and that's, that's a good way to know. But you want to be very careful because you don't want to be caught uh, looking at it when totality ends, uh, because that's when the sun comes back in, and uh, you don't want to be, again, looking right at the sun. Oh, I, I'm hearing that uh, our panelist has lost his internet briefly and he's back now. So hopefully we'll get him back in just a second. Um, uh, Tanish Kwatuari asks, what are myths and are they true about eclipses? Oh, there are so many. Um, one of them is that if you, if you look at an eclipse, you're gonna go blind. And that's not true. During totality, it's fine, it's safe. When a total, just before totality, when you're still looking at the sun, there's like a little thin crescent of sun that's unsafe to look at. It's actually quite bad because your eye opens up, your pupil expands to let in more light because there's less light coming from around you. And uh, uh, especially during the eclipse, it gets dark. And when the eclipse ends and the sunlight comes back, 
your eye, your pupil is open and that lets in a lot of light. So that that's dangerous. But during totality, it's not. And I've heard all sorts of things. Oh, the x-rays from the sun can burn your eyes out. Or, or if you look at the sun during a total eclipse, you'll die. I've heard that one. None of that's true. As long as you're taking the, the right precautions, it's perfectly safe to do this. And matter of fact, it, it makes me sad that people say some of that stuff because I want people to be able to share this eclipse. I want people to go out there and look at it because it is, it's everything everybody says. It, it, will, it touches your soul and will change your life. And people I know who even aren't that interested in astronomy who saw the 2017 eclipse uh, were just amazed and moved uh, some people to tears from what they saw. It is that beautiful and that amazing. Um, I can keep taking questions. Um, oh, we're ready for Gordon. Okay, let's bring him in. Okay, so Gordon Emsley from SunSketcher, another citizen science project. Hi, right, Phil. You hear me okay? I can hear you. I don't see you, but I can hear you. That's fine. I'm... The video should be on. There, oh, there you are. Hi. Well, hi. Sorry for that brief pause there. I, I suddenly everything froze and my screen went dark. <clears throat> Hopefully not a you know omen of things to come. I'm Gordon Emsley at Western Kentucky University, home of the famous big red mascot and also home to SunSketcher, a citizen science project with the power to measure the shape and size of the sun to a few parts per million. So I hear people say, well, isn't the sun just a sphere? Well, no. The sun rotates just like the Earth, and so it has an equatorial bulge to it. Unlike the Earth, the sun is a ball of gas, and so its exact shape is determined by interior flows beneath the surface, flows we'd like to understand better. So how will an eclipse help? Well, just before totality, a thin crescent of sunlight, as you mentioned, is visible. And the moon is not perfectly round. The mountains at the limb of the moon will pierce that crescent, creating dark gaps, while the sunlight will shine through the valleys in between, making bright spots as you see in the image. These spots are called Bailey's beads. Now, the exact timing of when the Bailey's beads appear and disappear by our team of volunteer scientists armed with smartphones with the SunSketcher app loaded and situated along the 100 mile wide eclipse path from Texas to Maine will allow us to determine the precise size and shape of the sun. It's easy. All you have to do is turn on the app and point your cell phone camera toward the eclipsing sun. The app automatically takes care of everything else so you can relax and enjoy this total eclipse experience. You can visit sunsketcher.org or scistarter.org for more news on the exciting SunSketcher project. With that, back to you, Phil. Fantastic. That sounds super cool. So um, how, how does this app work exactly? Well, knowing the exact location of the phone, the app will figure out from the eclipse, what we call ephemeris, the timing, when these times of Bailey's beads will appear. It will then program the phone to take a set of images about one second apart, about 10 seconds either side of the contact times, and then will automatically, with your permission, upload the photographs to a central server where scientists can analyze the data later. And where can they get it from? Uh, it'll be sunsketcher.org and it's not yet available. We're still in the process of testing it. We will be going to uh, Western Texas uh, on the 14th to test it out on the annual eclipse, which is not the total human experience of a total one, but nevertheless still produces belly beads. So we're hoping to iron out all the possible bugs in the app and make it available in you know, early spring or so. We will have a feature on our website where people can join up and receive news and information and so they don't miss it when the app does become available. Okay, where do people need to be to participate in this? Anywhere within this 100 mile path of totality. You do not have to be on the exact center line. In fact, we'd prefer if you distributed our volunteers either side so they get more viewpoints, different views of the occulting moon, which will help us determine the shape of the sun even better. So if you're going to see a total eclipse, whether it's for 30 seconds or the whole four and a half minutes, your observations will be valuable. I have some questions I want to ask you. We're getting some great questions from people in the audience. Um, will uh, taking pictures of the sun hurt your phone? 
No, we've tested that quite a lot because we did ask that question to ourselves. I have taken various cell phones of different makes and models and aimed them at the full blown sun, not even eclipse, and it did not do any damage, did not create any afterglow. If you're concerned, you can put one of these solar filters, just a set of eclipse glasses, the filter fat and material from there in front of your phone. Those photographs will be equally valuable. But best we can tell, it does not matter whether you use a filter on your phone or not. Use a filter on your eyes if you're watching the eclipse. <laughs> And I'm seeing a, uh, the same question from a few people, including my old friend Rob Sparks. Hi, Rob. Uh, and the question is, do you need a telephoto lens for your phone to do sun sketcher, or will the phone's camera be enough? Phone's camera is enough. And other projects you'll hear about later, we'll talk about use of cameras and so on. The beauty of this is anyone with a phone can participate. You simply set it up on a rock or something so it's pointed roughly where the sun is, and the app will automatically turn on at the right time, take the photographs, automatically stop at the right time, then ask you if you're ready to upload them. I will caution people that the photographs will not be terribly exciting. They'll look like a small little dot there with four or five little dots around it. Don't be discouraged. This is exactly what we want. The fact that your phone saw a belly bead and my phone 100 yards down the road did not is actually very valuable information. So in fact, your photograph with no dot at all is just as valuable as the photograph with the Bailey B dots. And one more question, um, very quickly, uh, what other science are you expecting to learn from this? Actually, it's fascinating. By knowing the shape of the sun, you not only learn about its interior flows, you learn about the gravitational field of the sun. The well-known dilemma existed about 100 years ago where the predicted shape of the sun was causing the planet's orbits to precess. It's called perihelion precession. And the observed perihelion precession of the planet Mercury was not observed to be the correct value that the theory would predict. And Einstein's theory of general relativity closed that gap by showing how this extra precession resulted by a different theory of gravity. Since then, since we're scientists, we'd like to doubt things. We'd like to really nail this down. And to nail it down, you have to know very precisely the shape of the sun. Right now, right now, from various observations from different spacecraft, we know the shape of the sun to about 50 miles or so. With the accuracy of these sun sketch observations, we would reduce that uncertainty to about a factor of 10, determine the shape of the sun to only a few miles. And therefore, it's gravitational effects on the planets. Very cool. Okay, so that is our first citizen science project. Again, that's called Sunsketcher. Our next one is the Eclipse Mega Movie, and that's going to be presented by Laura Petacolis. All right, thank you. Hello, my name is Laura Petacolis, and I work at Sonoma State University with the Edion STEM Learning Team. I'm here today as the lead of the Eclipse Mega Movie project. And I just want to tell you a little bit about what we did before in 2017. I saw there are some uh, mega movie uh, volunteers here from 2017, and we collected tens of thousands of photos submitted by hundreds of volunteers. Um, in 2024, we'll again collect coronal photographs taken in the path of totality, perhaps by you again or for the first time. The goal in 2017 was to combine these images into a, quote, mega movie of the solar corona. The goal in 2024 is a bit different. We're gonna track and analyze coronal features from their origin at the sun to their journey through the corona and out into the solar system. We'll accomplish this goal by combining eclipse photographs into high dynamic range images and studying these images with NASA solar data. A 2024 eclipse movie video will also be created. So don't, don't, don't be sad that we're not doing that. We are still, and it should actually be um, even more dynamic and more beautiful um, artistically this time because we learned a lot from 2017. Another opportunity for volunteers to participate will be through a Python Kaggle competition to mine the 2017 and 2024 photo data sets for important scientific findings. So if your coders out there, we're gonna need you to. So please join our team by filling out our signup form, which can be found on our website, eclipsemegamovie.org. Oh, you're muted, Phil. 
<laughs> as you were supposed to be. <laughs> yeah, I like muting myself uh, uh, as I'm typing or trying to take notes or something like that. My apologies. Um, I guess the obvious question is what special equipment do people need to do this and how do they get it? Right. So last in 2017, anyone with a DSLR camera, um, a digital single reflex DSL. Single lens reflex. Lens reflex. <laughs> um, you know them as the big cameras you hold around with big lenses on them. Um, we had we just required those and we'll still require those. Um, this in 2017, in 2024, we'll be also giving out 100 um, equatorial mounts. Uh, to um, volunteers who have their own camera their, um, with a lens, like a 300 millimeter lens and um, a tripod and who are willing to plug in a computer so that we can take more specific photographs this time. We will also be still collecting like we did in 2017, any photographs that anyone takes under the path of totality of the corona. Um, but we realized we really needed, as many of you if, uh, told us last time, <laughs> don't you want to tell us more what we what we should be doing? Um, yes, this time we're going to tell some of you a little more about what we want you to be doing. Yeah. So they should have some experience, obviously, uh, observing eclipses and doing things like that, I assume. Yeah, that helps for the for the hundred volunteers that will get um, this free mount. Then yes, they should have some experience. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Being able to to have the funding to be able to to send out equipment to people. So if there is anybody out there in the audience who uh, you know has a nice camera and is able to do this, uh, you know, is it just a mount or is it a tripod as well? Um, we are not currently providing the mount the tripod. We are it's just a mount. Um, usually. We, and we created those here at Sonoma State um, with a makerspace, a, a DIY mount. Usually they're $6,000 each. Um, so these are a lot less expensive. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so the idea is that, you know, the, the camera will, will stay with the sun um, for the four minutes of totality. Right. So, so it's something that you put on your tripod between your tripod and your camera, and it will track the sun as it's moving because you're zooming in to see the details. This isn't something you want to do on your cell phone. This is something you want a nice telephoto lens so you can actually get captured details of the corona. Um, what are you hoping to see from uh, some of these pictures? Well, from the 2017 um, data, we finally found uh, some plumes, which are big streams of plasma coming off of the um, sun. And what is um, very hard to study is how the, these features in the solar corona move from the kind of what we call the surface of the sun. It's not a surface, it's still gas, but um, it's that bright edge uh, from that area all the way out to where NASA is observing the sun. Um, and it's really hard to get that information in white light, except when you have totality. So this, how things evolve from their origin to out further from the sun is not very well understood. There's lots of theories, but we don't have the data to kind of confirm those models. So we're hoping to, um, at least for one day worth of data, <laughs> have um, some more information about that during solar max. That's fantastic. And I guess uh, with the sun heading towards the peak of its magnetic cycle, there's gonna be a lot of activity in the corona, a lot of things you all will be able to keep track of. Yeah, I'm very excited. That is terrific. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. And we'll bring up our next speaker, who is Mary Kay Severino, and I'm, I'm really excited to hear about this, from Eclipse Soundscapes. Hi, thank you. I'm Mary Kay Severino, the Education Director at Arisa Lab. I co-lead the Eclipse Soundscapes project alongside Dr. Henry Trey Winter. The Eclipse Soundscapes project is studying how life on Earth, specifically wildlife, is affected by solar eclipses. During a solar eclipse, the moon slowly creeps in front of the sun, blocking the sun's light from reaching the earth. And during the minutes before, during, and after eclipse maximum, when most or all of the sun is blocked, it's going to seem like dusk or night has come early. So what does nature think of this, specifically animals and insects? This is something that scientists have been wondering for a while. Almost 100 years ago, a scientist named Wheeler asked people to mail letters to him and his colleagues with their eclipse observations. Their observations included visual and sound observations on how the 1932 total solar eclipse affected nature, 
showing that eclipses can be studied in a multi-sensory way. The Eclipse Soundscapes project revisits Wheeler's 100-year-old study with modern means of communication and modern technology. We are collecting everyone's observations on and off eclipse paths, this time online via web form, and we are also using scientific audio recorders called audio moths to record sound data. We need your help. We are looking for observers and data collectors for the 2023 annular eclipse and the 2024 total solar eclipse. Cool. Uh, one of the reasons I like this so much, I mean, I'm an astronomer. I want to see an eclipse. I want to see the corona and the sun and everything about that. But having experienced one in 2017, there is a profound effect in your environment. It gets dark. It gets cooler. Uh, and even we all noticed uh, we were all coming on it in the few minutes before totality, the, the, the characteristic of the light changed because the sun is a disk in the sky. And when the moon is blocking most of it, the sun is just a thin crescent and that changes things. Shadows get sharper. It's eerie. And so I love that you're, you're doing something that is, you know, what are the effects of the eclipse? Now, um, how are people going to uh, keep track of what they are experiencing during this event? So I'll pop up on the screen a um, couple of images while I talk about this a little bit. So one of the roles, the observer role, we are asking people to keep track of their observations just in a notebook or a notes app while they're observing. What do they hear? Um, do they hear the crickets come out? Do they hear a moment of eerie silence? Do bees that typically come out at dusk, have they started coming out early? Uh, what happens to night animals? Is there suddenly an owl hooting? We would like this information. Also, do you? what else do you see? So what do you hear? What do you see? What do you feel? Just keep track of it in a notebook and afterwards hop online and submit that information on a web form. You don't need to be on that web form during the actual eclipse. You should be experiencing the eclipse and enjoying it. Some of the best advice I ever got from a friend, it was actually for a space shuttle launch, but it's the same for an eclipse, is... Uh, experience it. If it's your first time, experience it. Uh, you know, don't don't fuss with equipment or things like that unless you've done it before. Uh, and and I've, I I didn't take any pictures of the 2017 eclipse. None. Uh, I wanted to experience it. So I, one of the things I like about this project too uh, is is that you can experience it and sort of keep track in your head of what you're experiencing at that time and then report it later. So that's fantastic. Um, what are you, in a vague sense, what are you hoping to get from this? Well, since we have the two roles, we have this observer role where there's going to be a lot of um, observations from people, again, similar to that study 100 years ago, submitting their observations, their qualitative information. We also have um, the data collector role where we're also putting out audio moth data recorders to collect some quantitative data so that we have that to be able to start thinking about um, what's going on with nature when this happens, when it's almost like a sped up version of dusk, night, dawn. That is so cool. And people can get those from you. They can uh, go online and, and register to, to get them. So for the data collector role, which requires the audio moth, we do have a limited number that we do make available. Um, and it's also possible to purchase all of the items that you need for the kit yourself. So we intentionally chose an open source as low cost as we could find for a scientific grade audio recorder. They can be thousands and thousands of dollars. An audio moth is around $100, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less, depending on chip shortages. And then we also do have a time when we offer them for free for as many as we possibly can. So it's closed for the annular, but right after the annular eclipse, we'll be opening up the opportunity for people to apply for a free kit for the total solar eclipse. And if you go to the website, eclipsesoundscapes.org, you can sign up for update. So you find out as soon as that happens and whenever we add anything to the website. Oh, and come to think of it, um, if it's cloudy where you are, uh, this still works, right? If it's cloudy, you might not be able to get pictures, but it's still going to get dark. So the animals and the environment may still react, right? Mm -hmm, definitely. 
Um, you can be looking all around and seeing what are animals doing, what are insects doing. You can watch them. You can listen to them. Maybe you'll be in a park. Maybe you'll be in your yard. Maybe you'll go to the zoo that day. That would probably be a pretty cool place to figure out what's going on with animals and insects. That's brilliant. I love that. That's excellent. All right. Thank you, Mary Kay. And uh, let me add again, um, all of these projects are listed at scistarter.org, S-C-I starter.org, and you get more information there. Uh, so on to our next panelist, who is Corey Brevik with the Dynamic Eclipse Broadcast Initiative. Hi, my name is Corey Brevik. I'm at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, and I'm the team coordinator for the Dynamic Eclipse Broadcast Initiative, or the DEB Initiative for short. Um, this project creates a network of volunteer solar observation teams. The teams are spread all across the North American continent, covering Mexico, the United States, and Canada. Our goal is to have approximately 70 teams located both inside the path of totality and outside the path of totality. This provides the unique opportunity to simultaneously collect white light images of both the sun's surface as well as the corona. Volunteer teams receive training on the telescope system used by the project, and then we'll be conducting coordinated solar observations during both the 2023 annular eclipse and the 2024 total solar eclipse. And then besides collecting science quality data, we'll also be web broadcasting near real-time images of the eclipses as they progress across the continent. After the eclipse, we have some additional opportunities to do day and nighttime projects for the teams that are interested and wanna keep going with their equipment. We currently have about 50 teams, so we still need some more volunteer teams. Um, if you have a team that's interested in volunteering, you can email debinitiative at gmail.com. Um, we especially still need teams in the northeastern part of the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, and we need teams that are out of the path of totality. That's the part I like, is that um, you don't have to be in the path of totality, which is quite narrow. Uh, to participate in this project because you want to see the surface of the sun. You want to be able to see what's going on there, right? To connect it to what's going on in the corona. Right. And it's the farther out of the path of totality you are, the better your data is actually going to be. So this is a great chance for people who don't necessarily have the opportunity to travel to still get involved. And they need to be a part of a team, right? To get equipment. Right. So your typical team is four to 15 people. So these are, you don't have to be a professional astronomer. If you have a group of friends that's interested, um, we have high school and middle school teams. We have college teams. We just need a group of people because there's a lot of things happening really fast during the eclipse. So more hands on deck really helps. Uh, what equipment do you, do they need in, uh, in particular? Just to be so clear. The, we have a setup and I actually can share a picture of the setup with you. And we ask all the teams to have the same equipment. And then for that equipment, let me go. And we're pulling the wrong picture. Hold on, sorry. We go. Um, so we have a setup we can share with anyone who's interested. We are providing a limited number of these to teams. So if you get signed up, we can provide the equipment or Teams can purchase their own. It's about $1,800 for the whole setup. And that includes the laptop computer to collect all the imaging. That looks really cool. I think I want one of those. <laughs> it's only about a foot, the telescope. It's little, but it's got really high powered optics in it. So it collects amazing images. And it follows the sun. You have a, a tracker on it? Yep. Yep, that includes the mount, the timing. So yeah, once you get it lined up, it should follow it for the whole event. And it sounds similar to the earlier project where you're trying to you're trying to track what's going on from the sun out into the corona. Um, is there specific signs you're hoping to get from this? So there's a lot of development that's happening in the corona, especially because we're approaching solar maximum. So we want to be able to see what's happening on the surface of the sun and how that then spreads into the atmosphere, which is why those out of path observers are so important because it allows us to link what's happening on the surface to what we're seeing in the atmosphere simultaneously. 
Terrific. And, and I'm seeing some a lot of questions in the audience. How do we sign up for this? And um, all of the links that you all will need will be on. Uh, well, they're, they're, they're going up in the chat room right now. Uh, and again, if you go to a uh, size starter, they will be there. So this is a very cool project. And I and I can be very curious to see the data that comes from it. Thank you, Corey. And our last speaker is Amir Caspi with Citizen Kate 2024. Yeah, there he is. There we go. Excellent. Go. Uh, thanks, Phil. I'm Amir Caspi. I am uh, with the uh, Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado, and I'm the lead for the Citizen Kate 2024 project. Uh, as you've heard, uh, it's difficult to observe an eclipse uh, for many minutes at a time if you're just one person standing in one place. The eclipse only lasts for a few minutes, but to make the eclipse last for an hour, we can make it chase us. And we do that by distributing a team of volunteer observers from communities along the eclipse path uh, to observe the eclipse as the shadow passes over each one of them in series. Now, why are we doing this? The solar corona is hot. It turns out that it's millions of degrees. The solar surface is only a few thousand degrees. And the sun also puts out a constant stream of particles called the solar wind. These are big questions that we're trying to answer. Uh, and the Kate 2024 Next Generation Experiment will let us do that. We're going to use special cameras that observe light, uh, the polarization of light. So you might know that light is a wave. It waves in a particular direction. That direction is called its polarization. And it turns out the corona looks different in different angles of polarization. If you look at the image you see there, uh, the different colors, the blue and the tan, those are false color images. But what they show you is different angles of polarization coming from the corona made with cameras that we observed uh, with the total solar eclipse in April of 2023. So uh, for April 2024, we're recruiting teams, 35 teams that live along the eclipse path. We're going to distribute cameras, telescopes, mounts, uh, and all the equipment that they're going to need to make scientific quality observations of the solar corona in polarized light. We're doing that recruitment in October and November, so please stay tuned to our uh, project page on SciStarter.org. Uh, that will lead you to our Eclipse website. Uh, teams will be compensated for their time with honoraria. They will also get to keep the equipment in their community along with uh, educational curriculum and be invited to participate on our scientific analyses uh, and other ways of it interacting with the data. Uh, if you're interested, please either check us out on SciStarter.org or email us at Kate, C-A-T-E, at boulder.swri, like Southwest Research Institute, dot edu. Thanks. Dang, that's cool. Um, what kind of equipment are they going to need to do this? Uh, so we're going to be distributing equipment. I can even show you what it looks like. Uh, it is a telescope uh, with a uh, camera attached to the back. You can see here our observers uh, in Australia in 2023, this past April. Uh, the telescope looks just like this. It's not very big. Um, the camera is actually just a little doohickey at the back. There's a tracking mount that's here uh, and a computer. All of that is going to be distributed to the uh, Eclipse teams so that they can um, observe the uh, solar eclipse and again their local communities get to keep that equipment as a resource later on that is super cool uh and that that's going to be great too because uh with again with the sun becoming more active there's going to be a lot of stuff to see coming through up up through 2025. um so you talked about polarization of light um mm -hmm. and and what it is but what does it tell you about the sun that you're so interested in uh, that's a really good question, Phil. So uh, when light uh, from the solar surface goes out into the corona and it scatters off of the electrons that are there, it becomes polarized. Uh, and so when you measure the polarization of that light, it tells you about the structure of the plasma and the magnetic field that are there in the corona. And we want to observe that for two reasons. One reason is that we want to see how those structures evolve over time. We're able to use that information to sort of get a 3D picture of what the corona looks like. That's something that's very difficult to do from regular pictures, but polarization lets us measure that. And by measuring all of that information over the course of an hour for the eclipse, by having people measure it along the path, 
We can look for flows. We can look for waves in the magnetic field of the corona. And all of those, when you put those together with uh, fancy models, will help us understand, uh, for example, how the magnetic field releases energy to get to that million degree, multiple millions of degrees, and also uh, how that solar wind is born and then propagates out into the heliosphere. Great. And uh, that's super cool science and very important. Uh, and we're getting a lot of questions about where you have to be, what about the equipment. And let me just tell people that uh, Trevor Bartone from SciStarter uh, put up a link at 748. And that's 748 my time. It might be a different hour, but 48 minutes. And uh, there's a link to the Citizen Kate, the Citizen Continental America TELUS I think is this is the link it ends it's telescope but it ends at telus yeah. uh, and you can click there and there's again more information on the web about uh, to, to answer some of your specific questions um so uh that's great amir thank you very much and and um i know i'm an astronomer and i know i'm a science communicator and i know i love this stuff and i know i'm moderating this panel but let me say i'm very excited about all this it's not like i'm saying that because i'm here i'm 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 here because I am excited about these projects. I love uh, having folks uh, participating in science, as, I've, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, I love solar eclipses. I love solar physics. Um, I'm really interested in just nature. Uh, so the effects of the solar eclipse on, on animals around us uh, is an amazing thing. And so I, and several people said, how do I do all five projects? And I'm sitting here listening to you all talking about them going, yeah, I really want to do all of these too. And I'm not a solar physicist. So for me, this is a citizen science project. I just happen to know a little bit more about eclipses than, than some folks. But when it comes to the real nitty gritty science, uh, you know, I'm just sort of a, a, an interested layman too. So uh, these are all really super cool. Uh, you can find out all about these at scistarter.org slash NASA dash live. Um, I think we have a few minutes for Q&A from the audience. Uh, let me get my windows set up here. Uh, if there are any that uh, any of the other moderators want to throw to me, that would be great. I, I saw so many good questions. It's hard to sort of nail down. Um, but in fact, actually, one person, several people asked, what are Bailey's beads? And so, Gordon, if you can unmute yourself and answer that, that would be great. I am unmuted. Bailey's beads are named after a gentleman called Mr. Bailey. We first noticed these again the lunar limb the occulting edge of the moon is not perfectly round it has mountains that go up and valleys in between and you will get situations where the mountain part will obscure the sun whereas the valley in between lets the sunlight through they start off as breaks in the crescent sun that's still visible and gradually over a few seconds morph into the exact opposite where most of the sun is covered up, except the part in the deepest valleys that are just shining through, and they look like little spots of light or beads until that last little bead is extinguished as the lunar surface uh, covers the remainder of the sun. So they're basically a representation of the lunar landscape near the edge of the sun. The, Interesting thing is, if I was giving this, uh, you know, Q&A 30 years ago, I'd have said, this helped us determine the shape of the moon. Turns out we now know the shape of the moon better than we know the shape of the sun. We've had satellites orbiting the moon, lunar reconnaissance orbiter being one of them, which has got the moon's uh, shape and size to a few meters, mountains, valleys. That is our reference to use the Bailey Bees to then determine the shape of the sun in turn. Very cool. And uh, I'll throw this out to anybody. Um, this is an interesting question. During the annular eclipse, are we going to learn anything about the moon? Or is it just that we already know everything we need to know about the moon shape? I'll take that again real quick. <laughs> okay. This is not, as I say, the same total human experience as a total eclipse. Nevertheless, belly beads are still visible. But out of the edge, and you learn a little bit about the surface of the moon, a little bit about the size and shape of the sun, even during an annular. That's why we're going to be testing it in western Texas in three weeks. We'll be out there observing Bailey Bees with Sun Sketcher. 
So that's very cool. Um, yeah, I don't remember seeing them on the 2017 eclipse, but all I remember is just being overwhelmed by emotion. So I, I probably wasn't the best scientist uh, <laughs> detached uh, observers. Maybe I should have been at that time. Um, clearly, there's a lot we can learn about the sun and, uh, and well, and a little bit about the moon during this eclipse. And all of these projects are going to be fantastic uh, to do that. And I'm really thrilled uh, to hear from all the panelists here about these exciting projects. And um, I, think, I think it is now time to wrap up. Uh, to cut that short a little bit. I apologize for that. Um, but as you can see now, Oh, wait a second. Sorry. Here we go. Um, can we get the next slide up, please? There we go. Um, very excited to be a part of this. Uh, and I've got the wrong notes up. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, this event was part of Do NASA Science Live, which is a series of virtual events. These events will be updated on the Do NASA Science Live homepage and where you can also find past recordings and projects. So this has been going on for some time. There are a lot of interesting things you can find out that happened before. You can also visit scistarter.org slash NASA live to stay updated on what's going on. So stay tuned for future events. This event was produced in partnership with SciStarter, your first stop for science that we can do together. Take a moment, if you can, to join the SciStarter community by creating a free SciStarter account at SciStarter, that's S-C-I, starter.org slash login. With a SciStarter account, you can get updates and save projects to your dashboard, and you also have full access to SciStarter's resources. This includes free trainings to boost your confidence. I know if you've never seen an Eclipse before, you haven't used some of this equipment before, you can be a little, you'd be a little nervous using it. That's fine. You boost your confidence by going there and increase your knowledge. You can earn badges to demonstrate your new skills as well. And you can use SciStarter to find projects, communicate with project leaders like some of the folks we've talked to here, and get more information about how to get involved. These events are made possible with a partnership with NASA, yes, NASA, uh, SciStarter, and the Association for Advancing Participatory Sciences, formerly known as the Citizen Science Association. And again, some people were a little confused about the term citizen. You have to be a US citizen. No, you have to be alive and on the planet to be able to do these things. Uh, this event was highlighted by the Heliophysics Big Year, and we want to also give a shout out to all the projects involving heliophysics. And also, uh, my personal thanks to the folks from SciStarter uh, who invited me to moderate this panel and, and to the fantastic panelists, all five of you, and, and Mark uh, Kushner from NASA. You all did a great job. These are super exciting projects. I just can't get over how cool these all are. And, uh, uh, and again, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that because you know, they're asking me to say it. I really am really interested in this. I'm re really interested in seeing how uh, how all these play out and i'm really very very excited to experience these eclipses again myself i hope you all get to a place where you can watch them and watch them safely learn about the sun learn about the moon learn about the earth and hopefully it'll whet your appetite to do even more science thank you so much to our audience for participating tonight good night Thank you so much, Dr. Phil Plate. We're so excited to have you here uh, today helping us out with this event. Um, it has been a joy to hear everything coming from you as an expert, and you led us through very well. Um, so we need to give a good shout out to uh, our fantastic host. Thank you so much, Dr. Phil uh, Plate. Uh, also <laughs> renamed, I know every time I say Dr. Phil, I'm like, oh, wait, no, no, I need to finish that statement there. <laughs> Dr. Phil Plate, uh, and also known as the Bad Astronomer. And you can also follow him if you'd like on Instagram at the Bad Astronomer, just spell it all out. Um, and then you will find him on uh, Instagram. So for anyone who joined us here today, if you are on Zoom with us, we would love, love, love your input on how this event went and how you feel about it. So if you wouldn't mind taking our survey, we'd love to hear from you and how we can improve. Uh, and we'd love to spend time doing exactly what you suggest from us. So uh, we will look forward to that. For anyone who's able to stay later, uh, I know there were some Q&A questions left, but we we're reaching the hour. So um, we have some time to go over last questions for anyone who's sticking around. 
Um, and I will actually remove my screen share for that momentarily. Before I do so, though, I did want to mention a quick shout out to a partner that we also have to called the NASA Science Now virtual exhibit. They are live streaming this now from our YouTube stream, and they also will have a recording on their site for the next couple of weeks that you can look at from this, as well as on the SciStar.org slash NASA dash live website. Um, they have other resources there as well to explore, including some materials from um, Heliophysics Big Year. And just to remind you what that looks like, that's this page. So if you'd like to scan that QR code for access to that, you are more than welcome to. Uh, now in the chat, I did want to ask a selfish question before I hand it back to uh, checking through the rest of the questions. But I know a lot of people were curious about their best resources in order to figure out if they're in the right spot for the eclipse. For all of our guests who are here, because that's a question, there's other questions about resources. I'm just curious if any of you have specific resources that um, that you would point people to automatically for things that help uh, someone get involved. You can drop that in the chat. Maybe it's like a map that tells you where and percentage-wise you are in comparison to the eclipse, which will help them. Maybe it's a note about your project, um, about which people in the path of totality or outside the path of totality, something mentioned um, about accessibility there, I think people would appreciate as well. All right, I'll go ahead and drop my screen share so you can see all of us um, and go through the Q&A. If there are any more questions, keep them flowing um, and we will try to answer as they come. Um, for the most recent one I saw after that one, which um, was about recordings too. So for the recording, just to reiterate, that will be sent, um, or that is on the scistar.org slash NASA live as this recording will be there um, after tomorrow. In addition to the NASA Science Now virtual exhibit, we'll also be sending out a follow-up email to all of you who signed up today. Excellent. Okay. All right. Um, we'll be looking through the chat to make sure anything else is going on, but I see a lot of compliments, honestly. So thank you so much for anyone who is writing compliments in the queue. And I appreciate that. I was expecting to look at a um, look at a question here, but it looks like we might be okay. Excellent. All right. I'm going to go ahead and have us uh, drop our YouTube share unless I get a call out to not do that. But um, thank you everyone for your uh, your viewing, uh, viewing on YouTube. We're going to go ahead and end our recording and our uh, stream to YouTube and recording.